We will move on to questions to the Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment. Questions 1, 6, 10 and 11 have been withdrawn. I call Mrs Judith Cochrane. Mrs Cochrane. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number two, please. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The key strategic targets for tourism are contained in the programme for government and the economic strategy. The last couple of years have been very important for Northern Ireland tourism, and my focus has been to deliver on the tourism product, major events, and global marketing campaigns to ensure success and bring maximum economic benefit to the local economy. I am delighted with what has been achieved, and it is now an opportune time to consider future plans. A review of the Northern Ireland Tourist Board and wider tourism structures is due to be completed by the end of this month. Ms. Cochran for supplement. Thank you, and I thank the Minister um, for her answer. Um, and I would agree that um, action is more important, perhaps, than the strategy itself. And understand we are well on our way to meeting the um, PFG targets. With the Giro happening in the next couple of days, um, much of Northern Ireland has turned pink. And I would wonder uh, what the Minister um, thinks will be the benefits um, for local businesses, um, such as Ballyhackmore traders, who have really embraced it. And uh, just. To take up uh, your last point about uh, Ballyhackamore traders really embracing uh, the Giro. I think that has been the very strong point of the build-up to the Giro, the fact that communities uh, right across the race route have really got involved uh, in the whole festival atmosphere of the build-up, and of course uh, they will uh, be able to receive a tangible benefit as a result of all of that in their businesses as well. And I know that there are a number of businesses locally uh, who have been employed by the race organisers, uh, everything from putting down tarmac in the Titanic quarter to providing uh, support services, uh, health services, and those are all being provided locally here in Northern Ireland. So there is a real and tangible benefit. But of course, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the race is coming this weekend. We're all very much looking forward to it, and I do welcome the fact that even Stormont has gone pink for the event. Call uh, Mr. Cathal Boylan. Does the Minister accept that any future tourism strategy must be more than a standalone document for the North and needs to include provisions for cross border and all iron potential? Well, for start off, we do work with Tourism Ireland in terms of our promotional activities, and in actual fact, it's always a challenge to get standout for Northern Ireland in global markets. And I think that's what everybody in this house should be concerned about: the fact that our local market needs to be promoted globally across the world. Uh, and uh, I've been pushing Tourism Ireland in that respect, and will continue to do so. Make no apology for doing it, actually, because that is what I am uh, appointed to do: to make sure that the local tourism market gains the benefit. If there are uh, events happening in the Republic of Ireland that we can benefit from, then of course we will work with the authorities in the Republic of Ireland to take the benefit uh, for our own local market. Mr Mervyn Storey. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In relation to major events, can I congratulate and welcome the investment that the Minister and her Department have made in securing the Northern Ireland Open Challenge Golf Tournament in my North Antler constituency at Galgorm Castle? And can she give uh, an indication of how important such events, such as that event, uh, play uh, actually are to the Northern Ireland economy and will play in the future in terms of major events as we move forward to build a strategy for success? I think it has been seen since particularly um, our campaigning year of NI2012 that events have been very much the focus of the Tourist Board. The more events that we bring in of international standing, uh, the more uh, we get attention in the rest of the world. Uh, I was particularly pleased to be up uh, in Galgorm uh, last Thursday. Uh, to announce the investment in that event uh, for the coming year. Uh, it was a very good event last year, uh, and uh, I know that they're planning to build on that this year, uh, not just looking at golf, uh, but also having a food festival in and around the uh, golf event. Golf tourism is a huge um, uh, part of what we do here in terms of the tourism sector. £22 million is invested every year from people who come to Northern Ireland because of golf, and I think that that 
uh, on its own should let you know, Mr Deputy Speaker, why we spend a lot of our time talking about golf. Because we have the ambassadors, because we have the golf courses, we then uh, take advantage of that with our golf tourists. So, yes, events play a very key part uh, of what we do in tourism and will continue to do so. Mr Fergal McKinney. A, a, bit of a, a bit of an introduction. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I thank, can I thank the Minister and Mr. Flanagan? Um, does the Minister agree that a key objective of a tourism strategy should be the reduction of VAT for services provided by the hospitality sector? And uh, I thank the member for his question. Uh, and I know this is an issue uh, that the member for South Down, uh, his parliamentary colleague, has raised with me uh, as well on occasion. Uh, this, of course, is a matter for the Treasury at Westminster because we don't have uh, our own powers over VAT here in Northern Ireland. And we do believe that it would be beneficial to the entire tourism sector in the UK if VAT was looked at because, of course, we are at a competitive disadvantage when we look at our colleagues in the Republic of Ireland in relation to that. Mr. William Irwin for a question. Question number three, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The most recent uh, information available from Invest Northern Ireland is for the period to the 30th of September uh, of last year, at which point the agency had promoted 17,201 jobs against the 25,000 programme for government target. Invest Northern Ireland is currently validating the most recent full year performance information, which will include the number of jobs promoted and expects to be able to publish this information shortly. During the month of April alone, Invest NI has announced that its support will help create over 2,200 new jobs for Northern Ireland. This is fantastic news for all of Northern Ireland, with jobs being created in Londonderry, Portadown, Antrim, Carrickfergus, Belfast and Tyrone. It is the direct result of the hard work and continued focus of Invest Northern Ireland, myself and my ministerial colleagues, to promote Northern Ireland as a great location to invest and a great location to grow your business. Can I thank the Minister for her response? And it certainly is good to see jobs being created right across Northern Ireland. Can the Minister give an update on the number of jobs created in the constituency of Nuri and Armagh? Well, in terms of Nuri and Armagh, uh, the Jobs Fund has promoted a total of 316 jobs, and 250 of those have already been created, and that was at the 31st of December of last year. Uh, that includes 31 Jobs Fund business investment projects at various stages of development, uh, which should lead to the creation of 249 uh, further new jobs, 140 of which have already been created. So the figures uh, are good. Um, we're always looking to improve them, of course, and we will do so in conjunction uh, with firms already in Armagh and those firms who are looking to Armagh uh, as a positive place to invest in. Call Mr. McGlone for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her comprehensive reply to date. Um, will the Minister provide us with some information and some detail as to when we get actual jobs created as opposed to jobs promoted? It was something uh, that was raised with me last year, as he knows. We now have the figures for the Jobs Fund. That's why I was able to give the Jobs Fund promoted and created. And as you know, Invest Northern Ireland is looking as to how they can do that in terms of international investment firms as well. And uh, it's somewhat difficult there because we give them a, a letter of offer for a particular period of time, and they, of course, can ramp that up or down, as the case may be, during that period of time. Uh, so it's important that at the end of the period that they have a employed the number of people they said they were going to employ, but only at the end of the period. So in some cases they ramp up quickly and therefore the jobs are created quickly. Um, in some other instances it's at the end of the project that we get the jobs. So it is more challenging uh, with foreign direct investment jobs, but with the Jobs Fund we have, because of uh, questions, rightly so, about jobs promoted against jobs created, we have endeavoured to give that information. Call Mr Nesbitt for a I didn't actually rise, uh, and Mr. McGlone has asked my supplementary, and the minister has answered it. Thank you. That's one very happy member. I call <laughs> Mr. Samuel that. Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number four. 
I have regular discussions with the Minister for Employment and Learning, including engagements at the Executive Subcommittee on the Economy. My department and Invest Northern Ireland are already working closely with Dell to support apprenticeships and the provision of future skills needs for priority sectors and markets. Invest and I's Chief Executive participated in the expert panel established to inform Dell's review of apprenticeships and youth training. Dell, in collaboration with Invest NI and employers, has set up working groups to consider the specific skills required by key sectors, both now and in the longer term. Mr. Gardner, for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for her response to my question. Uh, could the Minister tell us what evidence there is of the attitude of local businesses towards the skills level on the workforce, and if she has suggested any improvements in this respect re recently? Well, in terms of the local workforce, one of our strengths here in Northern Ireland is the, our size, actually. So we interface with all of the major sectors on quite a frequent basis. And so if there are skills uh, gaps that are emerging, we are made aware of them in a timely fashion. And that's what led to, for example, the Software Testers Academy being set up between uh, myself and uh, the Department of Employment and Learning. Uh, because we felt there was a need to bring more software testers into uh, the economy, and that has been hugely successful. And actually, people uh, who have graduated from uh, the academy have, I think, uh, had a success rate of somewhere in the region of 95% in terms of uh, having a job at the end of the apprenticeship, at the end of the software testers academy. So that is uh, very encouraging, um, and we will continue to keep close from my perspective, alongside employers so that we understand where there may be skills gaps and it is in identifying those skills gaps that we need to work collaboratively to make sure that we can address those uh, issues in the future. Mr Gordon Dunn for a supplement. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker and I thank the Minister for her answers today. Can the Minister advise us on what has been done to encourage professional and technical apprenticeships within the, the public sector? Well, this is something uh, that I think we can assist uh, in very much because um, we feel that there's a, a need to look at this whole area um, and to try and bring people in uh, at an early stage to get them skilled up for work in, in the public sector. And actually, uh, I attended a very interesting conference this morning in Enniskillen uh, called uh, uh, Recruit and Retain, uh, which is a European conference with eight partners right across uh, Europe looking at how uh, in rural areas uh, we can recruit people to the public sector and indeed to professional jobs and then retain them in those particular areas. It was a fascinating uh, conference, Mr Deputy Speaker. I took a lot away from it uh, and uh, will certainly be looking at ways in which we can implement it. But I have to say, if people here think uh, Fermanagh is a long way away, they should try looking at Greenland or Iceland. Uh, there are certainly more challenging rural parts uh, of Europe as opposed to uh, Fermanagh, uh, and we should certainly remember that uh, in what we do. But certainly there are opportunities, I believe, uh, in trying to solve some of the problems that we know exist in areas to try and recruit and retain people in rural areas. Mr. Pat Ramsey for Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and, and I welcome the Minister's response to date. As someone who represents a cross-border constituency, the, the importance of collaboration between those areas and given the theme of apprenticeships and the development from the, the, the earlier question on higher level apprenticeships, has the Minister had any discussions with her counterparts in the South to develop an all island strategy on apprenticeships? Well, actually, it was the court organisation that had uh, organised today's event, which of course is involved in the health sector on both sides uh, of the border, and they were doing that in conjunction with partners from right across Europe. So it was um, something that I, I took a lot away from, and, and I intend to have some discussions uh, with colleagues about it, because I think there's more we can do, not earth-shattering things, but things that can make a difference to some of our rural communities, uh, and it can be a win-win both for the community and indeed for the professional people as well. Mr Ian McCrae for a question. Question number five, Deputy Speaker. 
On 6 February 2014, the utility regulator announced a licence competition for taking gas to towns in the West, with a licence award expected in the autumn. The project will provide the opportunity for up to 40,000 business and domestic consumers in Dungannon, Coal Island, Cookstown, Macrofelt, Oma, Enniskillen and Derry Lynn and Straban to have a more efficient, lower carbon and potentially cheaper choice of fuel. It is anticipated that construction works could commence in 2015, with first customers connected to gas in 2016. Mr. McCray, for supplement. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for her efforts in trying to deliver the, this much-needed gas to the West? But can, can the Minister outline the benefits that she feels that this will bring to local businesses, given the fact that a major employer in my constituency, Dale Farm, believe that the introduction of gas for them could save them in, in the region of £1 million? Pounds? And I think, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, when you put it in hard figures like that, it is very impressive the difference that um, gas is going to be uh, making uh, for Deal Farm and actually for other uh, public sector um, works as well. Uh, and last July, I wrote to the district councils in the West about the gas extension project, and we've been uh, engaging with Dungannon, Cookstown, Macrofelt councillors uh, on the 26th of March and with OMA and Fermanagh councillors on the 31st of March about the gas project. We're hoping to have a meeting uh, with Straban uh, in the coming weeks. So it is important that not only the business sector gets involved, but also the public sector uh, also embraces gas to the West so that they uh, make it a viable option. And I think it will be of great assistance uh, in terms of cost in particular uh, for those businesses. And of course, that's what we want to do to make our businesses more competitive. Mr. Sander, over it. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for the information today. I'm very pleased that our major employers uh, in the West will, will uh, be able to gain from having the option of energy from gas uh, in the West. Uh, can the, and the Minister has outlined the specific areas and towns that will benefit from the availability of gas. Uh, can the Minister uh, explain, will, uh, will there, in terms of the domestic consumers who will be able to avail of gas, will they? Will it just be new bills that we'll be able to connect through to the gas pipeline, or maybe she can give us some info information on that? No, uh, actually, uh, we should be able to retrofit in terms of homes that are already there, because if you think about it, those homes that have access gas in and around the, the Greater Belfast area were all retrofitted uh, in, in terms of the gas distribution, uh, and so certainly we would hope. Uh, that many homes along the way will seek to find out more uh, about gas uh, and indeed put it in as an option uh, for themselves. So uh, we do realise that the gas extension project must be economically viable uh, and uh, it has to have expected returns covering the cost of any new network. Uh, the utility regulator will work with the new licence companies uh, and it's something I think that should be universally welcomed that at last uh, the west of the province is going to be able to access gas. Yeah. Mr Joe Byrne. For... Deputy Speaker, I welcome the Minister's answers and indeed her efforts in relation to bringing gas to the west. In terms of Shaban and Oma, what are the likely bottlenecks in trying to make sure that we get this as quickly as possible, given the competitive edge that this would make to local businesses going into the future? Well, I thank the member for his very positive comments in relation to bringing gas to the West. I would just ask him and other elected representatives in the West to work with the department to make sure that we can deliver it in as timely a way as possible. As I've said, I'm hoping that the licence will be awarded in the autumn time, uh, and then, of course, they will be looking at the particular route of the gas transmission line. Uh, and that, of course, as we know, every infrastructure brings challenges with it. Uh, and I would ask that all members look at it as simple pathetically as they can. Mr. Phil Flanagan. I thank the, the Minister for her answers. Having engaged with a number of, of manufacturing businesses in our respective constituency, this, this will be a, a game changer for an awful lot of the, the large energy users, so we, we welcome it on, on that front. But can I ask the, the Minister to give the House an assurance um, that the rationale for her enthusiasm for this project um, isn't to sustain and justify her flawed support for fracking and for money? 
Well, I congratulate the member on getting fracking and Fermanagh into a question uh, about gas infrastructure. Uh, and of course, uh, there, just to put on record, Mr. Deputy Speaker, there is no fracking license in Fermanagh. I want to say that very clearly because there's been a lot of misinformation uh, about what's going on in Fermanagh at the present time. A lot of excitement from some quarters, I have to say, as well. Um, but really, everybody should calm down. Uh, and uh, just deal with the issues as they come up. My support for gas to the West is because there is an infrastructure deficit in the West of the province, and therefore we should address that infrastructure deficit. And I would hope that he would join me uh, in congratulating the department and the work that they have done so far in relation to that. Uh, members, while we don't discourage innovation, I would encourage members to try and ask questions that are relevant. Uh, to what has been discussed. Uh, I call Ms. C uh, Mrs. Karen McKevitt. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, question 7. The Irish Open in 2015 will help grow domestic and overnight visitor numbers and spend, provide a positive image of Newcastle and the Mourns internationally, and build on other recent high profile events to further demonstrate Northern Ireland's capacity to host major events. The Northern Ireland Tours Board will work with key partners to plan for and deliver the 2015 event. NITB will host an industry workshop similar to that in 2012 to encourage the tourism businesses in Newcastle to maximise opportunities arising from the Irish Open. NITB also plans to tailor world host training to support the volunteer programme for 2015 as they did in 2012. NITB will be promoting the 2015 Irish Open at the 2014 event in Fota Island, County Cork in June, and over the next year will be working up plans for destination campaigns featuring golf as well as potentially a dedicated golf campaign. Mrs McCabot, first supplement. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for uh, her response. And the Minister will know that the benefits of the World Police and Fire Games and the information that was provided by the, the, and gathered up by uh, the Tourist Board and locals uh, into a booklet, uh, etc., uh, will be a great help for uh, the like of the um, uh, tourist providers, uh, particularly in and around South Down. Uh, can I ask the Minister what financial uh, commitment uh, has the Executive made to secure the Irish Open um, in 2015 and 2017? Well, I'm not going to get into figures in relation uh, to commercial and confidence negotiations, but what I will say is that because we had the Irish Open at Portrush in 2012, it has provided us with a great uh, learning opportunity for further um, events, uh, both uh, in Newcastle and indeed in Inniskillen in 2017. So all of the uh, things we can take away, and, and don't forget 2012 was an absolutely fabulous success, uh, and we should take away the very good messages from that as well. As we know, it had a sellout crowd of 130,000 spectators, and one major plot it's not only from the European Tour itself, but also, importantly, from the public uh, that attended uh, the event uh, in terms of exemplary organisation, uh, production, and indeed transport and parking initiatives, because we all know that that can be sometimes a challenging uh, issue in terms of major events. And certainly, we will be working uh, with Newcastle. Uh, in terms of their planning and as well as that of course Newcastle has the advantage of having much longer to plan uh, for the Irish Open in 2015 when we announced in January of 2012 that the Open was coming in June it didn't give us much time to put things into place so you have much longer uh, to plan and I'm sure it will be a tremendous success given uh, the course and the fact that it is a world-class course and that already there is a buzz uh, around the professional players about coming to play Royal County Down. On Mr. Sammy Douglas for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her response so far? Can I ask the Minister um, what plans, if any, that the Northern Ireland Tourist Board would have in relation to the local authority and the business community? Well, again, we will be working uh, with all partners, our, our statutory partners, uh, be they DRD or indeed the uh, new local council. Uh, by that stage, uh, but also the industry, and uh, we will be looking at how many beds we have in the immediate area and how we can support uh, the hotels, the bed and breakfasts, uh, the self-catering accommodation. So it is hugely important that we get everybody uh, working in partnership because that was what the success 
uh, was in terms of the open in, Port, in Royal Portrush, the fact that we were able to pull everybody in and that they worked in a very collaborative way. And you know, when success happens, sometimes uh, we don't uh, uh, congratulate those involved. We just take it for granted and move on to the next event, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I do think that we need to sometimes step back and say, well, that was a job well done. And it was a job well done uh, for Royal Portrush. And indeed, our council partners, DRD, the Police Service of Northern Ireland, and all of the other partners that worked with us at that time. Mr. Roy begs for a question. Question number eight. My department, through the Northern Ireland Tourist Board and Tourism Ireland, has undertaken new campaigns to promote the various locations used in filming the Game of Thrones. Recently, at the invitation of NITB and Tourism Ireland, almost 20 journalists from around the world visited Northern Ireland to explore some of the locations, including the Dark Hedges near Ballymoney, as well as Cushion Dunn, Cairn Castle, Glenarm, Ballantoy, and on the final day, Tullymore Forest, Inch Abbey and Castle Ward in County Down. I also recently launched Tourism Ireland's advertising and social media campaign in conjunction with Game of Thrones creators HBO uh, to promote Northern Ireland holidays across the world. NITB showcases a number of Game of Thrones tours on its consumer website, where there is also a section dedicated to specifically uh, the Game of Thrones exhibition in June of this year. For I, mean, I, I thank the, the Minister for answer, her answer of the spectacular uh, rugged uh, scenery within my constituency of East Antrim and indeed in the, the Causeway Coast uh, has been uh, uh, widely promoted by the, the series. But can the Minister advise how she is cooperating uh, with the uh, Northern Ireland Environment Agency in terms of uh, developing uh, medieval Carrickfergus Castle uh, and other such facilities to capture that imagination and enhance the tourist product uh, that visitors might have when they come? Well, I do know that the uh, castle has been used for indeed other filming projects, not just the Game of Thrones. I just can't recall the name of the uh, film that was uh, produced there. It was something techno, something. I just can't. Overlords. Overlords. That's right. It was. Um, and and so the castle has already been identified, and I know uh, that the minister has plans to open up uh, Carrick Fergus Castle. Um, to the wider public. Uh, it is a fabulous resource to have, uh, and I hope that when we do that, we don't lose some of the authenticity that we have in Carrick Fergus Castle, but instead capture that and allow everybody to do, take advantage of it. Mr. Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, there was a recent announcement by HBO and uh, Tourism Ireland regarding the usage of the HBO branding, and given its international, internationally recognisable uh, brand, uh, what plans are there to ensure that uh, as this progresses and makes uh, further significant inroads uh, into filmmaking in Northern Ireland, to ensure that we maximise the return? Well, I thank the member for his question. The, the actual partnership between HBO and uh, Tourism Ireland has been very, very significant. I think it's the very first time that they've agreed to such a partnership. Um, it's a major coup for tourism and, and indeed for Northern Ireland that we can access the, the massive fan base that there is. Um, particularly in the United States of America, but not solely uh, in the USA, down into South America, wider Europe uh, and beyond. So what we're trying to do is to use um, some of the uh, language, some of the strap lines of the series, and then put it alongside some of our beautiful uh, coastline and indeed the dark edges and places like that. Uh, I'm not sure if the member wants me to use the strap line, which I understand is used, uh, in one of the um, uh, Game of Thrones series that all men must die. Uh, I'm not sure that that would be one we could use, uh, but <laughs> I'm not sure my female colleagues would uh, have to say something about that. But in any event, um, it is a fabulous uh, opportunity for Northern Ireland tourism, and I very much hope that we can take advantage of the fact that we are now alongside HBO advertising to the wider world, and it's a great opportunity. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the Minister for her answer. The Minister may be aware of the historic film trials uh, in counties Wexford and Wicklow, uh, which plot uh, those films right from the 1930s up until uh, more recent films such as Braveheart and indeed Save, from Saving Private Ryan, and also the economic benefit to uh, places like uh, the village of Cong in County Mayo from a certain quiet man. Are there any plans to actually do something similar here within the North? Grimmel, 
actually the exciting uh, prospect of the um, routes is the fact that private sector companies have now got um, tours right along uh, those particular points that I've been talking about so that they are uh, actually going to bring people along on private tours and show them all around uh, the North Antrim coast and indeed into County Down as well and be able to plot it back uh, into the Game of Thrones. So yes, that is happening uh, by a number of private companies. Order. That ends the period for oral questions. We will now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Trevor Clark. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, can I uh, ask the Minister, or maybe first of all congratulate the Minister on the announcement last week in my constituency of Schrader with 241 jobs? But could the Minister indicate to the House, because while that's only last week, maybe the Minister could indicate how many jobs she's been successful in bringing uh, to Northern Ireland, even particularly April or this year, indeed? Well, in April, uh, April has been a tremendous uh, month for us in terms of jobs announcements. We were able to announce 2,200 uh, new jobs for Northern Ireland, and I think by anybody's standard that has uh, been tremendously good news. Uh, Schrader, uh, the company that he mentioned, we announced 241 new jobs, an excellent company taking advantage of research and development, putting that then into production and manufacturing and thereby creating jobs. So I think it was there that I said we were in a virtuous cycle of R&D uh, bringing forward jobs and that's exactly what I've been talking about over the years. Uh, sometimes people think that if we spend a lot of money in research and development we could have spent that on jobs but of course it will be spent on jobs in the longer term because research and development leads to production, leads to manufacturing and that leads to new jobs. Mark for supplementary. Yes, again, and, and again, I thank the Minister for her response to that, and in terms of that, even her department within Invest NI and the work they've done in securing those jobs. However, many would like to focus on the negatives in terms of the jobs front, and we only ever hear the publicity in terms of the negative uh, attitudes towards jobs and unemployment. But maybe the Minister could give an update to the House actually what difference has made to the employment, unemployment figures on the register within Northern Ireland. Well, in terms of the unemployment register, we have for the 14th month uh, seen a reduction in terms of people claiming unemployment related benefits. Uh, in the month of March, it was reduced by 700. Uh, we very much welcome that. However, we're not complacent, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We know that there uh, is still a, a big job of work uh, to be done, and that's why we try and, and work with companies at the very high end uh, and also companies at the lower end, because we know that there's a need for jobs of every description, and that's why we'll continue to work hard to try and bring as many jobs as we can into Northern Ireland. Mr. Phil Flanagan for a topical question. I'll ask you, Cordy, can I ask the Minister um, if she will ensure that all positions created by or through Invest and I meet the, the living wage, following the recent example of Belfast City Council, which became the first council in Ireland to adopt the living wage as opposed to the minimum wage? Well, of course, uh, Invest Northern Ireland is interested in the private sector median uh, wage when we look at jobs created because our focus is very much on rebalancing the Northern Ireland economy and the very best way uh, to bring wages up uh, is to bring more high-level uh, jobs into Northern Ireland. And that's why I was particularly delighted with some of the announcements during April uh, which brought in jobs of a higher level, such as the jobs in EY, uh, a very good announcement, uh, bringing in jobs of somewhere in the region of £40,000 uh, 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 as an average when they're all put in place. So that is tremendously good news, and those are the kinds of focuses I think that Northern Ireland and Invest and I should have. Sir Flanagan for supplement. I'll ask her and I give it to the Minister. She, she evaded it fairly well. Um, but can I come back to the, the specific issue here? Is there are um, an awful lot of people that are in work um, and they're living in part poverty due to um, the low wage economy that exists in some place. So can I ask her whether she would give any um, um, indication whether she will introduce a policy with Invest and I where all jobs created through that agency will be paid at least, at least the living wage to try and take the working people um, out of poverty? Well, can I say to the member um, that, in fact, if he persists with the living wage agenda, it could actually cost people their jobs? And I actually remember very well coming to this House to talk about the jobs fund and the need to create jobs, yes, not of a very high level in terms of salary, but jobs to allow people to get off the unemployment register. He is now saying that he doesn't want those type of jobs. He only wants jo jobs of a certain level. 
And really, you cannot have it both ways, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. We must be consistent. We must focus on bringing high-level jobs into Northern Ireland. That's certainly where my focus is. And if we can create jobs for people along the way, which maybe aren't of a higher level, but will give them an opportunity to work for a living, then that's something I will definitely engage in. I call Mr Kieran McCarthy for questions. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, in earlier responses to myself, the Minister recognised the importance of uh, Explorers and Portaferry as a regional facility in terms of tourism, science and economic development. Has the Minister had sight of the business case which will transform and maintain Explorers um, by, as submitted by Ardsborough Council? Thank you. Well, as the member will know, the Tourist Board has provided uh, a considerable amount of money to Explorers over this past uh, number of years. Um, when Ardsborough Council opened the facility back in 1987. Uh, and I do, of course, and I readily accept that Explorers uh, is an important facility uh, and a key visitor attraction in the Strangford Lock area. And I do congratulate Ardsborough Council in all of their efforts to secure a positive future uh, for the facility. Uh, however, I think the struggle comes in terms of the required one-off capital grant uh, of £914,000 towards a general refurbishment and redevelopment. Uh, certainly, from my perspective, NITB uh, currently have no capital funds available. And that doesn't mean that the executive has no capital funds available. I'm simply uh, relating to him that NITB have no capital funds available uh, in terms of that particular ask. We will, of course, support them in everything else. But in terms of capital funding, we don't have that capital funding. If we did, we'd probably open a tourism development scheme uh, for that purpose. Ms. McCarthy, for a supplement. I thank the Minister for her response. Uh, she may know or may be aware that the 28th of May is the deciding date by the Council um, for the future of Explorers. Does the Minister recognise the urgency of the, the Executive giving its approval? Uh, for the future of Explorers before the 28th, and will she commit to give her support to the um, report that comes before the Executive, hopefully uh, during the course of this month? Well, certainly, we will uh, look at any report that comes to the Executive before the end of this month. I do, of course, recognise the urgency because this has been going on for some time now and there is a need to bring closure uh, for everybody uh, involved. And uh, Certainly, those who have been involved in the campaign have conducted themselves in a very professional manner, and I think that should be acknowledged. Um, and It is something that will come before the Executive, I do hope, before the end of May to allow a decision to be taken. Mr Paul Given for a question. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I commend the Minister for the work that she's been doing on the Giro d'Italia, particularly, uh, and it's on the record from the producer of BBC Sport, her work in getting this televised for the people of Northern Ireland. But what hopes does she have uh, from this event in terms of maximising uh, its benefits to Northern Ireland? Well, I think there's uh, two answers to that question. The first is locally here. I very much hope that it will again raise civic pride right across Northern Ireland. And I do think the fact that BBC Northern Ireland is going to be able to show live coverage of the event right across Northern Ireland is a positive uh, part of what we're doing. Uh, and of course, then internationally, what we're trying to do uh, is to say that Northern Ireland is a good place to come uh, and visit. Uh, for various reasons, but none least the whole outdoor activity uh, sector in Northern Ireland, which has grown over this past number of years. And we have a lot of product in terms of outdoor activity. And if you would like to spend your holidays in that way, then there's no better place than to come to Northern Ireland. So uh, it's a global message, but it's also a message to our local community as well to have civic pride in Northern Ireland. And I hope they very much feel that pride by this weekend. Given for supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for that response? And obviously, this event, coupled with the different golfing events that uh, she's been pioneering and bringing to Northern Ireland, fits into the overall tourist, uh, tourism package uh, for the province. Uh, in terms of where that uh, product is going and the overall tourism uh, uh, potential that exists in Northern Ireland, where does the Minister see that uh, progressing uh, into the future? 
Well, of course, our program for government target is to make tourism uh, a billion pounds industry, and I think that we're very much on target uh, to do that. Um, and the way in which we have done that is that we have invested uh, in tourism products. So if one thinks of Titanic Belfast, for example, and the way in which we have made that a real catalyst uh, to bring people into Northern Ireland. But around that also, we must have events. And, uh, uh, events, dear boy, are, are very important uh, to us in Northern Ireland, and that's true from the Irish Open, it's true from the MTV Music Awards, and of course the World Police and Fire Games, and now the Giro d'Italia, uh, which we're very much looking forward to. So uh, it is about bringing international events to Northern Ireland, and I do hope uh, that when the world looks into Northern Ireland at the weekend, that they will be well impressed. Mr. Leslie Cree is not in his place. Mr. Jim Wells is not in his place. Ms. Anna Lowe. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister earlier mentioned the job creation in Strider, uh, which is great news, and, and which is, as I understand it, as a result of new EU regulation on car tyre pressure. So can I ask the Minister um, if she would agree with me that it is in Northern Ireland's economic interest for the UK to remain part of the European Union and to play a full part in it. Well, I think what you've seen in Schreider is that they've looked at the market, whether it's in the United States of America or indeed in Europe, and they've future-proofed themselves uh, against that. And they've said, well, what regulation uh, can we see coming into our sphere and how can we address the challenge that that brings? And I think it's a very clever way uh, of building your business and speaking to the management of Schrader, uh, they have been very clear that they have great growth plans for not just the European Union but actually into China now is their uh, next target and they have a number of people working in China to try and uh, figure out where those opportunities are. So it is a case uh, that businesses will, if they are future proofing themselves, will look to the opportunities and I think that is what this company has done. Thank you. I uh, certainly very much agree with, uh, with the Minister. But I think is it not important though, for us to, to remember, and, and I, I want to ask the Minister's uh, opinion on, on this, that we must provide uh, certainty. Uh, particularly a lot of investors look at Northern Ireland. Uh, the benefits of, of investing in Northern Ireland is very much, first of all, it's an English-speaking country, but secondly, uh, that is within that is within uh, the EU, so uh, it, it, is it not important that uh, we, we should remain in the EU um, to, to attract inward investment? You know, I say this to the member, there are many businesses that would say if they were out of the EU that they would benefit in terms of a cut in regulation because as she will know, 70% uh, of our laws come from the European Union and they feel very burdened by that. So what we're trying to do is address that through our Business Red Tape uh, initiative to try and address um, those regulations which they feel are burdensome. But I think you will find businesses that will want to remain within uh, the European Union and likewise you will find businesses uh, that feel that they would be better off out to use the terminology. Uh, so I don't think that there is any clear answer in this from my point of view. What is very important is our membership of the United Kingdom, and I think you've seen that um, over this past couple of months develop in the argument about Scottish independence. Uh, and I think uh, businesses will be very clear that the United Kingdom is much better than a standalone Scotland. That's something I very much agree with, uh, because I think the four nations of the United Kingdom work much stronger together, and that's certainly the message that I get from businesses. To Sydney Anderson for Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Speaker. Minister, over the last number of weeks, we have uh, received encouraging news from both the Ulster and Danske banks uh, making a profit in the first quarter of 2014. Uh, can you outline uh, what support InvestNI is giving to companies who are having difficulties in getting finance to grow their businesses? Well, first of all, let me say that I very much welcome the fact that uh, both of the main banks have returned profit. I think it's a, a good sign that they are dealing uh, with their difficulties, and I hope that that means that they can lend more 
to businesses. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, as the member will be aware, Invest Northern Ireland have developed their own suite of access to finance products, and in doing so, they, they hope to provide support uh, to companies, but also to work in partnerships with banks, so that perhaps if Invest Northern Ireland goes in with a package, that then the banks can come in on the back of that as well. And certainly, the Agri Loan Scheme, which has been uh, launched, the whole impetus around that is because the banks didn't feel uh, confidence, perhaps, uh, to invest uh, in, in, uh, in, in poultry, particularly where there was very little security. Uh, we came in and tried to provide that security, and now we've seen some of those loans going out the door of the bank. And I think that that's something, um, it's a good template and that's something that we should look to use in the future. Order time is up.